Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you again for being with us. It's on Tuesday, 2.30 to 3.30. The name of the show is We Should Know. I want to thank Nicole for introducing this show each and every week. And I want to really thank you for your commentary and your comments from our previous show. Um, we we're talking about behavioral health. Amy Watson was with us and Courtney um, Boyette uh, talked about uh, mobile crisis response right here in this county and in the region, how available that was and had a number of folks to call and make comments about that and what was going on with behavioral health and substance abuse in general. Today I want to move, uh, I guess, kind of quickly to somebody you know, probably uh, know as well or, or many folks know much better than me, uh, Representative Larry Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell, you've got, again, to remind folks that are listening and, and may not uh, even passing through the area, uh, your background is just always uh, stellar to me when I look at it because you grew up um, looking at not necessarily one of those things that people would see a panacea. Uh, you're like many people in this area, grew up in an agriculture community uh, uh, within the education realm, but your father was not a teacher. He was actually working at, as a custodian at the school, I understand. You ended up uh, deciding apparently at some point in time that, that little trigger flipped and you decided I want to get an education. So you ended up being a school teacher, superintendent. From superintendent of schools, you've served on the county board of commissioners, uh, board of trustees at community college. Um, currently now, eighth term in the house. Uh, someone could easily say you're a pretty highly recommended statesman for North Carolina. What did I leave out of that? Well, I don't know if you left anything out. <laughs> But uh, yeah, my dad uh, was a farmer and custodian, and sometimes when I think about the temperatures like we're having today, I mean, uh, I think that's one of the things to help motivate me too, <laughs> to, not, to not be in the tobacco field all of my life. But I do enjoy it because I got a lot of uh, basic skills and things by working on the farm, things that I have used throughout my life. Well, I know you share with me um, th this, and I, I did this last week, uh, to kind of give a salute and a, uh, a commentary of appreciation to our law enforcement officers that serve us and protect us in our communities uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, and I actually ask our listeners and viewers when they saw a person uh, that with a badge, whether they were local, state, or federal, to just simply say, appreciate your service, or say something good uh, to, a, to a law enforcement officer. We're in a state that really, and you and I have talked about this uh, a bit off air, uh, I'm a bit concerned of some of the, the high level of volatility uh, that's going on and I want, to, I want to kind of bring people a little bit of understanding. Folks in your position that are statesmen on the state level, uh, you guys make laws law enforcement officers enforce those laws. Uh, district attorneys are the prosecution branch to ensure that the laws and, and the particularities of the laws are carried out. Do you think we need to go through more of understanding of civics in our society and, and kind of give, give us your thoughts on that? Yeah, I do. I, I was a history teacher and so I'm very familiar with uh, constitutional law and all of that, that uh, and how we arrived at where we are uh, as far as uh, law and order is concerned. Uh, and I have really been concerned about things that are going on in the United States in the last year or so. So much so until uh, when we were at the Martin Luther King event, I talked with the uh, mayor of Clinton mm -hmm. and I told him I thought that we uh, needed to get together and maybe teach some of our young people about uh, law enforcement, have the highway patrolmen and sheriff's department, police department, all of them get together with some of our young people and just kind of tell them about what happens, you know, when you have a, they stop one on the street or something like that, or, or to see some of them congregating around different places and all. And, uh, and, and I talked to them about having the cameras on the individuals mm -hmm. and all that. And he said, I'm a step ahead of you. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we already have them in the city of Clinton. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, the police officers already have them. And, uh, and, and I thought that was uh, you know, a good first mm -hmm. step in getting things going. And then when I saw the situation that happened at Burger King, and I saw all of the 
footage that they had there with the cameras. I said, well, he was a step ahead. We didn't know what was going to happen, but it's good to have those things just so that people can understand what is going on and also to protect the uh, uh, persons involved in uh, making the arrest and all of that. One, one of the things I've noticed that is rather interesting, and it's, it seems that there is a somewhat of a divide now uh, between the Governor McCory and, uh, and Attorney General Roy Cooper on the availability of footage from those cameras. Um, the, the governor's um, commentary that I have seen uh, and what the bill that went through the legislature mm -hmm. holds in reserve that footage and does not make it public and the rationale I understand behind that and please please clarify this for us is that it it could be incriminatory to some folks if they just generally open that footage up to the public and news media because officers oftentimes find themselves in, in, in very um, precarious situations and the the public may not want that seen to everybody in the world so then That's the other true. side is well it's, we don't want to make sure we want to make sure uh, that we're not hiding anything so what where are we at on that as far as releasing the footage because there's a number of, of agencies in North Carolina I know Dunn Police Department has had cameras for quite a few years yeah that was uh, debated quite heavily on the floor of the house uh, about what to do to do in those situations and it was pointed out and, and the way I understood it was that you know when you have the cameras on you don't know exactly what's going to be on that camera Mm -hmm. uh, and so the only thing that would be a really important would be what it catches that uh, will relate to uh, uh, some kind of offense or something uh, to, for the defense of the officer or for the person who was involved. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but it, it, it captures everything in the area and sometimes it might, might not be necessary to show anyone who asks uh, to see a picture unless they're involved in it in some way. Uh, uh, it's really not, uh, well, it just shouldn't be open up to the mm -hmm. public just to come in and, and see what's on your camera. Because you might go into situations, and uh, one thing we were talking about, uh, you know, my son being a videographer, mm -hmm. he was talking about sometimes he covers, uh, he covered accidents. And he said sometimes when you go to uh, uh, an accident, you see things that you don't think that you need to show to the general public on TV that evening because uh, you, people would not want you to show their uh, family members or something uh, in the situation that they were in in a car accident or something like that. And, and so, so you just uh, have to be careful about what you show. You know, like and, and I think to, to some degree you have to also look at it and say what value does it add to the information That's needed correct. to be released and, That's right. and oftentimes just for sensationalism uh, I think it's where we cross that line if it's just that's sensationalizing true. we've got a, a real issue. And that's what he was saying you know uh, that uh, he, he did not believe in covering all of that even though you have that footage because you can't help from taking it when you're there and getting it but you don't show that on the six o'clock news, or whatever it is. I want you to, and, and again, I'm, as you, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, it's, it's your background as a uh, or teacher in with history in schools. This whole civics lesson kind of idea. I've, I've had uh, Jeff Gordon on with the Highway Patrol. Of course, I've had the Colonel as well. But I recall a year or two ago when we had this sense of unrest that started in different places. In fact, I think it may have been Ferguson. Um, I had those guys come on, uh, Lieutenant Jeff Gordon and then Sergeant Baker with the Highway Patrol and, and ask him to speak specifically to what they would expect someone to do if they were stopped. And one of the things that, that um, Lieutenant um, Jeff Gordon talked about, which I thought was very credible, um, was the idea that let's don't have court beside the road. That's correct. Uh, because they are a part of a process of observation and identification of laws that were violated, that were passed by an assembly of people. If it's a North Carolina general statute, it would be you and others in the general assembly. Speak to that and how important it is for, for young folks to understand that this driving today that's out actually milling about in the public, if they break a law, uh, there's a process. Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, if, if they're going to ticket you, you don't try to talk it out with the uh, 
patrolman or whoever it is that gives you the ticket at that time because you'll have your day when you can bring about a defense or whatever it is if you have it. I remember very vividly uh, I was on my way to the hospital <clears throat> they told me my dad was passing and I was speeding and I remember a highway patrolman stopped me and uh, and I told him, I said, well, I was on my way to the hospital. I said, they say my, my dad was passed. And he started uh, sort of telling me, well, you were speeding. So I, you know, I said, so, well, just go on and, and give it a ticket because mm -hmm. I need to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we'll talk about that later. And, mm -hmm. that, and, that's, and that's true. That's Absolutely. what was important to Absolutely. me. Uh, you know, I didn't care about paying for the ticket or whatever mm -hmm. I had to do, but I needed to get to the hospital. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think that's, that's the kind of thing that you need to uh, think about. Just go on and do whatever needs to be done. There's a day when you can defend yourself before the judge mm -hmm. or whatever it is and mm -hmm. if you have a defense. But don't try to do it on the street. Do you, do you think there are folks that have, and I've heard this commentary on some national media channels, that have lost confidence in the judicial system itself uh, and you hear commentary that the system, the judicial system, not just anything law enforcement's doing, but this is moving it up, up to a higher plane, uh, is, quote, rigged, that there's something that's not, the scales are not balanced, that, that justice is not blind, and, and there are issues that need to be adjusted in the judicial system. And I'm going to let you answer that now because we're fixing to go to a break, but I want you to think about that. As we come back, uh, I, wanna, I want folks to kind of hear from you, uh, from your background, what you think about that and, and what we may or may not need to do uh, to review that or take a look at it. We, we'll be back in a okay. moment. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Representative Dr. Larry Bell, District 21 right here in North Carolina. We'll be back in one moment. You're out for an evening on the town. Finally a chance to relax and forget that you left your front door completely unlocked. Fortunately, you just installed a security system from Star Communications. With just your cell phone, you can check on your house, lock it down, light it up, and get back to relaxing. You forgot to put Buster in his crate. Unfortunately, we can't help with that. Security and automation from Star Communications. Call today to find out more. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know it's on air. I want to thank you for being with us today. We're talking with Representative Dr. Larry Bell. Uh, Dr. Bell, former superintendent of county schools, uh, eighth term in the North Carolina House of Representatives in District 21 right here in North Carolina. Uh, you've seen a lot of things uh, in your career as, as a statesman, as an educator. As we went off air a while ago, we were talking about not only uh, were you superintendent and also a teacher, but one of the areas you taught in was history and kind of got involved into this civil issue of uh, law and uh, basic civics, I uh, uh, guess you could say, as it relates to education. We were talking about the whole issue as it relates what folks should expect from our society with our justice system. And um, when, when we were ending that discussion, I just kind of left it open to say, do we have an issue with the judicial system? Uh, is it law enforcement is, or is it lack of understanding of how the system operates? Yeah, well, I think uh, the question is, you know, that most people have, is there anyone above the law? They don't like mm -hmm. to see uh, just anyone getting away with it because of their position or whatever. Mm -hmm. And many times when it involves the highway patrol officers or police officers, uh, if something happens, they want to see them uh, prosecuted if they need to be, mm -hmm. just like anyone else. You know, like we're all citizens, you just have different jobs to do. And I think it all boils down to fairness and uh, <clears throat> I guess one of the best compliments I ever had was whenever uh, one uh, parent told me that a child that I had taught told him that I uh, said, uh, why don't you take that before uh, uh, Mr. Bell because he was having a problem with one of his other kids in school mm -hmm. and said, uh, said let him uh, deal with that said, because he's the uh, most fair person I ever, ever seen, you know, when it comes mm -hmm. to dealing with that. And so I always would tell people it's not equality that you want, but it's fairness. You want to make sure that uh, you treat people fair. Because you treat them equal, you would do everybody the same, mm -hmm. even right. though, uh, you know, even though they may not have the same circumstances involved. So you want to make sure that fairness and justice is uh, 
that prevails in the situation. And I think one of the things that oftentimes I hear people talk about too is that is that equal uh, equalism, if you will, and and looking at it in the sense of equal opportunity yeah. uh, for folks. And and if you move that message forward, folks feel somewhat disenfranchised from not only their judicial system but from their opportunity mm -hmm. to succeed. But and explain, and I want to open that door too, um, and because I, I keep looking and just looking at your background and, and have done, we've talked many times on this show and I've looked at your background many times, but you were given the opportunity <coughs> and you took that opportunity and made things work in probably one of the most uh, uh, tumultuous times that we have seen in this country as relates to race relations. But, but you made it work. I mean, you moved up that ladder from, from educator to superintendent to uh, House of Representatives to board member with the commissioners to, I mean, just a number of key positions. You made that work for you. So the question is, is it opportunity or the lack of using that opportunity? Well, you need the opportunity first, and then it's up to the individual to take advantage of the opportunities. And, and uh, you probably heard me say before, I know that uh, I was not the, uh, say the most intelligent or the smartest one in my classes as we grew up, but, uh, uh, but some of the students in my classes didn't take advantage of some of the opportunities they had available to them, but I did. I was willing to reach out and and go for things, even though I you know didn't have uh, funding and everything, resources all the time. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, uh, you know, you just, in other words, you take a, a, a lemon sometimes and you make lemonade out of it rather than sitting there complaining about the bitterness. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think that's uh, what happens. And then many times when you get back, you find people who will say, uh, you did this, I didn't have the opportunity. And the first thing I think about, you know, you had as much opportunity as I had, but you didn't take advantage of it. And that mm -hmm. was, uh, your fault, it wasn't the fault of somebody else. I think oftentimes it, we, we too often raise the finger and point the finger when we didn't maybe make or take that advantage ourselves yeah. early on. That's uh, correct. And we can all look back, uh, I'm a, I'm a, would be fairly confident that we could all probably look back and say, well maybe if I'd have Definitely. done this, this would have been different, no matter where you are. That's correct. But uh, some of these things, especially, um, and, and again in North Carolina, and we've got very similar backgrounds because I grew up on a farm just like you did and it was it was during those times but we we have to work through that um, a, as I think about those kinds of things as it relates to North Carolina I think about the budget that we've got and as I understand it was like 22.34 billion is that what That's we correct. finally agreed on between the house and the Senate right. <laughs> One of those issues is right in your wheelhouse, which was education. There's been a, um, I think, a lack of understanding. There seems to be um, a certain um, group of people that says, well, we need to pay teachers more. The budget revealed, according to what I have read, that the teacher salaries, uh, average teacher salary rate was raised 4.7% which put all teachers making somewhere between, starting between 50 and 54,000. Clear that up for us and what, what actually is going on with that. You said, uh, repeat uh, that. 4.7 is what uh, right. one, one commentary uh, said from a news source mm -hmm. for, that were lawmakers, uh, the original observation. Did that change or was that? No, that's, that's, that's uh, about correct, but I, I, the other part the was 54, uh, The average uh, teacher uh, salary in North Carolina was, was more than 50000 a year, up to 54000 I, I think uh, it has reached the point that a teacher can make that much, but, uh, but they're not making it now. But they, uh, uh, some of them may be, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, it depends on the, the degrees that they have and mm -hmm. their longevity mm -hmm. and all of that as to whether they make that much or not. But uh, it would not be, I would say, the average teacher. You see, uh, one thing they started the uh, beginning teachers off at uh, at least thirty-five thousand, which I thought was very good mm -hmm. that uh, we had reached that point. Uh, but then in between there, that's where most people fall, but then you have 
those who have been there for several years with advanced degrees and all, some of them could reach uh, in the 50s, but it wouldn't be the norm. That would be a little bit above the norm. This General Assembly, and, and the, this was a, a phrase that was used quite a bit um, in referring to this General Assembly, that uh, there was a, on issues related to money and budget, the word performance, yeah. uh, especially in education, was, was put out there. What, what, is, what are they really saying? What, what are you guys looking for when you say to a teacher, you know, you, we're going to pay you based on performance? Well, <clears throat> that is one of the things where I uh, differ with a lot of them. And uh, most of those you hear talking about that are not educators, because uh, <laughs> they were say a third grade teacher who gives a test, and the students perform well. They say, well, they should get more than than the other teacher. But not being an educator, they don't realize that that if because a kid can read very well in the third grade or has reached that average, it's probably because of those teachers before the third grade. Mm -hmm. preschool teachers, mm -hmm. first grade, second grade, and all of them. It took hard work from all of them to get that person to be able to read at a third grade level. Uh, it wasn't that third grade teacher who did it. It was a combination of all of them. And that's why, you know, people like me would say all of them need to be paid well. And, and I think uh, persons who reach and go over and beyond <clears throat> that a principal, somebody say, go over, over me on. There should be some funds there to, to give them extra money if necessary, but, but all of them should be paid a decent salary. How did it get focused toward that bonus for third grade teachers? I mean, is, is the third grade a kind of a breaking point, or, or wh well, why was the, it built around? Yeah, the, the, uh, I think uh, uh, data shows that if, if they're not reading or performing well, the third grade usually uh, it's hard for them to reach success as they go on up line to the high school or beyond. It's usually based on the third grade, just like uh, uh, they have fourth graders helping to determine the number of people who will be in your uh, uh, court system or whatever. You know, if they're in the ISS and all that during that time, chances are a percentage of them will grow on to become uh, uh, offenders later on in the, in the criminal system. There was quite a bit of discussion about low performing schools uh, in, the, in the General Assembly this session and <clears throat> that w even went to the point of the state possibly going in, taking over a school system and opening it back up as a charter or private school and, and that created a, a huge uh, kind of pushback by some people, very positive by others. Explain what was going on with that. Yeah, I did not support that part of it at all because uh, it was saying that if a uh, school was low performing, that they could let a private entity come in and take over those schools and, uh, and work with them sort of like a charter situation. But I feel like that if, uh, if you're in a school system, that school system itself can do more to get that, bring that school level up to par than somebody from the outside who didn't know anything about the community and all of that uh, to bring them in from an outside source, I really do. And so I think uh, we ought to leave that up to uh, the State Board of Education and the local school system to bring the schools up to par, give them flexibility in dealing with that, you know, uh, but, but uh, let them handle it themselves. When we, uh, when we come back from break, I want to talk about that local responsibility of local school boards and nobody knows better than you on this as to where we need to increase that and whether we need to look at more responsibility being given to our state board and our uh, superintendent of public schools on the state level but I'd, I'll hold that as, as we come back and and give folks time to be thinking about that process because there's a lot of folks that support private and charter schools. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. We're talking with, with Representative Dr. Larry Bell. We're talking particularly today about the $22.34 billion budget. We'll be back in one moment. Stay with us. Whether it's video, voice, internet, or cellular, Star Communications connects you to the things you love. 
It's what we do and have done for over 50 years. Star Communications, your local technology company. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We should know it's on the air. I want to thank all those folks at the radio station, the morning crew, with the old man, Nolan Z, and uh, of course, Grandpa, the um, lunch hour, you'll hear Wayne Weeks with the Gospel Hour. Great show each and every day, Monday through Friday. Tommy the Fly in the afternoon, of course, Nicole with the Country Store. And I would be uh, amiss if I did not mention Robert Stroud and the Boogie Shoes Radio Network on Saturday afternoon. I want to thank all those folks for mentioning We Should Know, and it comes on Tuesdays at 2.30. We're talking with Representative Dr. Larry Bell today. Uh, Dr. Bell, we went off uh, to our break. We're back. We're talking about uh, just a very critically important thing for folks, and that schools and charter schools and private schools and schools that are low performing. The question would be, are schools low performing based on the environment the school is in? Is it an education issue? Is it a home parent issue? What is one of the key factors that happens with low performing schools and why are they low performing? Yeah, I think uh, one the key to it is, is the overall community uh, basically, you know, the, the makeup of the community and all. If uh, if you have people without jobs and or you know, and, and the poverty level is real real high, uh, it's hard to come in there and think you're going to uh, compete with students uh, who who uh, live in an area where you got universities and all these kind of thing and, and things in the area and uh, so many things that help to educate a child. So uh, all those things have to be taken into consideration. And if you're going to move on out of uh, from a low level to a high level, the people who live there will probably have more of a insight into what those students need to bring them up mm -hmm. than somebody sitting in the general assembly who don't know, uh, you know where where the, where this particular location is. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know uh, some of uh, the people here, I won't call some of the names, but you know, the little places here in the county mm -hmm. that uh, if you call the names, people wouldn't even uh, know where it is uh, Very true. Uh, or anything like that. And, uh, and and how can they tell you what you need in that area? So I think they need to leave it up to the local school districts in collaboration with the uh, State Department of Public Instruction as to the clinical needs that they may have uh, to move them forward. Uh, I have no problem with uh, private schools. I think they should have, you know, private schools for people who want to attend those and all. And uh, and uh, but I think you know they should pay for them too. And uh, and when it comes to the local schools, we need to have flexibility in dealing with uh, things that maybe you couldn't ordinarily do because sometimes you have to think outside of the box to reach some kids. You know. Uh, it might mean uh, having longer school days, uh, having uh, people in the community to come in and do some certain certain things in the schools that you wouldn't ha ordinarily do. But any anyway, it needs to be a local uh, uh, collaboration with uh, the state and state board of education and the local school boards. There was a, a quite a bit of discussion also with schools about the school calendar, and I know mm -hmm. you weighed in heavily on yeah. that and, and looking at year-round schools and, and changing the, the structure of the way education was disseminated in the state, mm -hmm. um, even to the point of some schools doing some studies um, as related to when school uh, actually uh, started, whether it was 8, eight o'clock or 9 or 10 o'clock and got out later, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. what, what was revealed in that and what did we learn from that? Well, I think it's still ongoing, but some school systems are having year-round schools. Uh, some of them, I don't think, ever stopped having uh, some schools to do that. They have that flexibility uh, of doing it. Um, I don't know whether it will ever become one of those things where it'll be, uh, you know, in every school district that they would have it. But uh, I liked that concept because students have a tendency to kind of unlearn some things mm -hmm. when they're off too long during the summer or whatever it is. It takes them a longer time to get back on it. Uh, my grandkids were in a program like that one time. And 
uh, I think it's still at an experimental level, and some of the ones in Wake County, I think, are involved in it right now, and they should be able to study the ones who are in there and, and mm -hmm. find out if there's some uh, positive things and maybe move toward doing it system-wide if they think it, if it works, you know. One commentary that, that was um, was relayed to me also was that, the, that we're working off of a system of school attendance based on a, um, a statewide agrarian economy in which children were back basically needed and, and almost was uh, an, a necessity. Well, in fact, it, when I grew up, it was a necessity. You had children in the field working and those kinds of things. And that we've kind of moved away from that now, so there's not a need for, for having that crop year to start in, in April or May and then uh, in school uh, take back in or start, as, as uh, the word used to be, uh, in uh, September, that you can actually do that, remove that, and it's not going to impede it, that we're still operating off of an antiquated system. Yeah, well, that, that's true. Uh, it was mostly dealing with uh, uh, compensating uh, people and the needs of uh, agriculture folk, but now it's uh, tourism. That's the mm -hmm. biggest thing. When I was doing the calendar bills, uh, most of my opposition came from the tour tourist industry because they wanted uh, students to work down at the beaches during the uh, summer, you know, the college mm -hmm. students and high school students or whatever. And, uh, and they also felt like uh, if the children were out, people would travel to the mm -hmm. beach areas and to the resort areas uh, while the kids were out during the summer and, and they thought it would uh, decrease the revenue that we got from taxes and all of that. And so, and, uh, and so they fought it pretty heavily. But I, I really think that uh, the way things are now, people will usually travel all of the year going yeah. different places. I think that's something they need to take into consideration too. And, uh, and we need to think about the kids' education first when we, when we look at, and we've talked quite a bit about the education piece, other state employees, uh, according to what I have read, um, were getting a, an incentive um, as maybe as much as 1.5 percent in, uh, increase that would uh, in some cases be a bonus, not an increase in salary. Um, and a lot of folks would look at that and say, well, you know, any money is, is that we can receive is good, but at the same time, it doesn't do anything to their base pay. That's correct. And, and usually if you get a, a bonus, uh, it may not re be reflected in your retirement systems either, you know, mm -hmm. over the years you get it. Cause like this year, I think you're getting a 1.6, the retirees are, and many of them have asked for that, so I'm glad I can throw that out to them. That would, be a, <laughs> that would be a bonus instead of a... It's going to be a bonus, probably paid around October the 16th to the 18th, I understand. But they don't see it next year, so therefore they're go next year they're going to be going, what month. happened to that money? They won't yeah, we'll see, see it next, next month. month. <laughs> it's like somebody make a mistake, so we're letting them know that it's not a mistake. It's a one-month thing. That's exactly right. <laughs> Some people would say that's a teaser. <laughs> kind of think it might be. Yeah. <laughs> I want to touch on one other thing, education, then we'll move to something else. Is there was some controversy with the university system, in particular as it relates to tuition at several of our universities. One of those was UNC Pembroke, Western Carolina, Elizabeth City, um, State University. Some of those schools um, receiving uh, a tuition reduction, should I say, uh, and there was a couple other. Uh, and there was some pushback. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea behind the legislature looking at that was to increase people enrolling and going to those schools, but mm -hmm. yet the schools felt as though it, it created a disenfranchisement for them. Yeah, Try we, to explain to us yeah, what we, was we talked about that quite uh, at length, and, and we had some of the chancellors to come in to talk about that. Uh, uh, first of all, we felt like it might be a, a, a setback to your community colleges too, because you're bringing the tuition down about the same level as a community college, and and then our, our for that institution who had the Lord would not have the funds to hire professors to carry on some of the programs that they have in, in the schools. I mean, because you have, you have to pay them, so sometimes mm -hmm. that's what your tuition would go for. So they would not be able to compete with the others, and and you're actually bringing them down to the level of uh, community colleges, and they, and they 
I had a setback this, so they said, if you want to help the students, give us that money and let us use it for uh, scholarships for those students who may be having a problem paying the tuition, that if we have the flexibility to, to help those students along and they know it's there, that they could better use it that way than they could just by uh, lowering it for everybody across the board. And, and I, th I think this, the, the other comment and, and some of the demonstration actually that was done in Raleigh about mm -hmm. this, uh, quite a few people showed up to demonstrate was uh, it, it kind of it was kind of lessened the quality by saying lower tuition here and it and not there, so therefore you didn't get the same quality education. I think that was what I was hearing some of the demonstrations. Yeah, and then then uh, you competed with the private school sector too. You know they have to char charge a, a much higher tuition so. Mm -hmm. If you have it almost free, uh, uh, nobody's going to, I mean, when you start talking to parents about sending you to college and they start looking at the tuition, they say, why can't you go over here to this school? You know, we can send you over there. Yeah, and get the so same about education. a tenth of what it would cost somewhere <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah, that's right. And so, so it just was kind of upsetting the whole spectrum of education. I think that, as you said, that, and when we look at that spectrum of education, folks do look at that as being a, a critical piece either when folks are going into a profession, whether it's pharmaceutical school, whether it's law yeah. school, whether it's uh, in the medical profession or whatever. They do oftentimes look at the schools you've attended and what that school's reputation is. That's correct. You know, and I think we've got some good ones here. Yeah, we have in North Carolina. So we're going uh, we're going to go to our last break. When we come back, um, I want to touch on uh, two things very quickly: mental health, behavioral health, and then I want to touch on the notorious House Bill Two. Oh, and I have okay. it in front of me. So okay. if there's any questions, maybe you and I can figure it out. Well, Ladies and okay. gentlemen, we'll be back in a moment. Stay with us. We're going to be talking about some critical issues that has faced the uh, legislature with Representative Dr. Larry Bell. Uh, we'll be back in just one moment. Call a friend. Stay tuned. Home where no burglar can roam, where my kids and their pets safely play. With security by star, I can check in from afar, hit the lights, lock the door, night or day. Really? Yeah. I can see my cameras, switch the lights, lock the doors, set the alarm, all from my phone. Their prices are right. My home's locked up tight. Star security makes me feel great. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Thank you for being with us today. We're talking to Representative Dr. Larry Bale, District 21. Uh, Dr. Bale from up in uh, Seymour Johnson, the line kind of meanders and comes all the way down to the southern part of Sampson County. So your constituency base is broad, scoped uh, from, from one section of the state to the other. You get a, I'm sure you get a lot of calls and a lot of commentary each and every day. Oh, yeah. One of those things that is interesting to me is some of those things <coughs> that we've talked about, which is low income schools, which is areas of, of uh, poverty. Uh, one of the things that we need more and you hear consistently uh, is the idea of jobs. And we've had an opportunity here, and I'm gonna let you speak to that. We had John Swope a while back talking about some of the industry coming. Chemtex, uh, I'm gonna let you speak to that and what, what's happening with that. Yeah, well, uh, we passed an agriculture bill that had uh, some issues in there about Chemtech coming mm -hmm. to uh, Sampson County. So, uh, and so naturally the Sampson County delegation, such as Jackson and myself, <laughs> were very high on that, and he presented it to mm -hmm. the Agriculture Committee in the House, uh, of which I am a member of. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it went over very well, and uh, we had to try to tell them, you know, about how many jobs would be created into this area, and it was something like 60 or something like that, and, and even though it might not have sounded like it was uh, a whole lot to some of the people, in the uh, more metropolitan areas, but for Sampson County to get 60 jobs That's huge. at $40,000, probably minimum salary, uh, I mean, that's that's huge for it our economy. Really is, and so we were willing, to, you know, to go all out to do that. And we and sometimes, you know, whatever incentive we needed to give, we would do that. And then there were so many spinoffs from that, you know, getting the product and all of that, where the farmers would be growing uh, products to be used in there and and all. I mean, it's just uh, almost unlimited as how much success it could be for our county, the economy here. 
and, and I bring I bring that up primarily because I, I like to I like folks to understand that that quite frankly there are times that everybody does go hand in hand to make things happen. That everything is not just partisan politics. That, oh, that when it comes to jobs, when it comes to looking at school issues and education, that things do come together. For, oh yeah, for you we, guys. we work together uh, very well uh, on the most part. You know. Behavioral health is another issue I want to touch on in this last segment is uh, that that continues to be a concern for the state of North Carolina uh, in literally in the millions and uh, of dollars, billions in some cases. Um, as we look at that, we're talking about everything uh, and last week we talked quite a bit about response and, and the kinds of things that the mobile crisis folks were seeing here and that East Point and some of its personnel dealt with each day. But when we look at it from a state perspective of money, um, you know, you see 30 million here, 20 million there, 475 million here. That's a huge expenditure of money, but it is necessity because we can't we can't incarcerate uh, and put in detention facilities behavioral health pe people that have legitimate behavioral health problems. Nor can we leave them at emergency rooms. How, how are we and are we moving in the right direction with that? Well, I, I really think, you know, this is my personal opinion, that uh, we are waiting too late to deal with some of those issues. You know, we, we can't keep isolating things uh, like mental health from the education system or whatever. Mm -hmm. Whenever students have problems in that third grade and fourth grade and uh, they're constantly going to detention and and people identify them as uh, uh, as having some problems, mm -hmm. uh, mental health problems. We need to deal with them then, and those students need to be followed up on as they move on up in age and everything, because if you don't watch out, they're going to be the very ones that we have to spend a whole lot of money on, and it's easier for us to spend it on mental health programs than it is to me to wait until they're incarcerated and, and, uh, and spend thirty-four, thirty-five $35,000 a year to keep somebody in a prison. Mm -hmm. And then, then you let them out after a few many, few years and uh, you don't have a program in there to deal with it. So they're right, right back home with the same problems that they had in the beginning. Because they've cut out a lot of the programs in the prison system mm -hmm. that will actually deal with them. It's better to have some mental health facilities, facilities out there that uh, you can send uh, people to from time to time. And, and I think when, when we look at that and we look at a lot of some, uh, many of the problematic issues we're seeing in our society today, um, you know, wh whether you look at Sandy Hook or you look at the, the horrific murders in Dallas, um, obviously there's something wrong That's in somebody's correct. brain that does those kinds of things. So it takes it from the day-to-day -day level of behavioral health issues to the extreme level, That's but that's a huge chunk of money that comes out of both state and federal budgets. That's correct. And we, and we need to talk about it. We don't need to wait until something happens you know, before we start talking about these issues because all of us know about it and, uh, and we know our, most of us have been around uh, our children, the family members and all that uh, we know that may need some help. Mm -hmm. And we might not have the money to do it ourselves, but we ought to be able to find some help out in society to help these people because in the long run it, it may have to pay in another way. And, and of course that's one of the, the things that we talked about again last week is giving folks a, a number they could call that yeah. people could actually come and sit down and, and work with them and diagnose wh whether it's a, I think the, the in information last week with one of our um, uh, guests said uh, that they had a child as young as three. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's age is, is not something that's uh, that you factor out, you factor that in. If, you, if there's an issue and you think it's an issue, there is people that can come that have specialized training to deal with that. Yeah, and, and one of the things that you mentioned to me earlier about what we do in the legislature as far as uh, getting bills passed and whatever, uh, uh, most of the work that my uh, legislative assistant uh, happens to do is deals with constituent service. And, uh, and many times people forget about that. I might be home, you might see me driving on the streets in Clinton, but my LA is still in the office. And, uh, and many times she's getting calls from Goldsboro, Dupin County, Tamsin County, about you know, questions that people have dealing with uh, issues in the state that relate to them. And uh, 
And one thing about our office, we might can't solve all the problems, but we can get some answers to you probably about as quickly as you can get them anywhere because they asked us within 24 hours. And you've got a very, uh, very professional, very well-qualified uh, person, Carolyn Edwards. I, I've got to say, I've talk, I talk to her quite often when I need to know something from your yeah. office, and as a lot of both our senators and representatives mm -hmm. do, but, but Carolyn has just such a, uh, she has a desire to find out or to try to help you, and yes, such, such a pleasing person. So. Right, I, I just tell her I gave her a, a shout out today <laughs> on the show. I want to move quickly uh, before we run out of time. I want to touch on uh, that the, the notorious House Bill Two. Yeah. I want to touch on that in two aspects. One, first question: uh, Is House Bill Two really turning a lot of folks? I know it's been in the media, but is it really turning a lot of business and jobs and money away from North Carolina? And if so, why? Well, I was at the. Uh, the governor had us in two weeks ago, so it was uh, for a chat on, on House Bill 2 and, and other issues. And uh, that question was asked to him, and uh, he was saying that uh, there was a lot of talk about it, but he hadn't had uh, that many to actually leave the state of North Carolina because of that. And so they were trying to uh, address it, and I think uh, the effort was in the, the bill that we had that I did to deal with some of the discriminatory practices mm -hmm. that they had on there, but uh, I don't know whether it was enough to satisfy all of the people who were talking about leaving North Carolina for different reasons. So uh, I signed on to a bill to have it repealed at the whole uh, House Bill 2, and I was hoping that that would have gotten some consideration that didn't mm -hmm. get heard at all. Uh, so it's still you know, active what we had, and other than what we did to try to eliminate the discrimination piece of it, which was the part two, I believe, of, it, of the bill. The bathroom issue still remained the same, you know, uh, as it was, uh, uh, based on gender, you know, biological mm -hmm. gender, and this kind of thing, and uh, you know, I I couldn't see that much wrong with what was going on before. I never knew there was a big problem with that, with people knowing where they need to go to the bathroom. And I, and I just thought maybe it might have been something we shouldn't have dealt with, period. You know? Well, and I think one of the things that, that, I'm, that I'm reading and, and understand is it really was pushed forward by Charlotte, North yeah. Carolina, and, and it became an issue as a result of Charlotte enacting uh, a city ordinance that said it didn't matter where you wanted to go, you could just go to whatever bathroom you wanted to. Yeah, well, but, but they said that, that has statewide implications yeah. because we have people going to Charlotte from all over the state, so they would ask, you know, if it's done in Charlotte, why is, isn't that the way it is in Clinton? Yeah, or Wilmington or anywhere else. Yeah, that's right, and so it became a statewide issue because of that, and, uh, and, uh, and that was it. But they said it wasn't really the bathroom piece that the people were talking about it was really uh, discriminatory yeah. part of it, you know. Uh, and I think for, for a lot of folks, it's just kind of common sense, you know, if you're, yeah. if you're a man, you go to, a, to the men's room, if you're a lady, you go to the women's room, but mm -hmm. uh, when you look at a, a segment of the population um, that, that perceive themselves as something other than what they were created to be, uh, that disagree with that, it depends on I guess who you listen to or how you mediate that. So, and it's, it then it goes right back to education. Most of us are not educated enough on those issues to be able to talk about it too much. I know it was new to me, and uh, uh, so I, you know, I couldn't deal with it really intelligently like I would well, love to have. Well, I, th I think uh, when we look. Uh, going forward probably that's something we will continue to look at and it may be a time that we need to sit down and have a conversation specifically about oh, yeah. that and, yeah. and as I'm sitting here looking at the bill now, break that out into pieces. So I want to thank you for being with us today okay. and, and uh, wish you best of luck going forward and stay strong. All right, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again next week on the radio. Say something good to a law enforcement officer and may God bless. Thank you.
Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of We Should Know with host J.W. Simmons. If you have a question, comment, or suggestion regarding this or any episode, please send your emails to we should know edu at gmail.com. And remember to tune in every Tuesday at 2.30 for another informative episode of We Should Know.